your friend calls you. You want to, it's your friend's voice, it sounds like your friend, you're having a conversation with your friend. You're not going to be able to know whether that's your friend or a counterfeit version of your friend. You aren't going to know whether this is a real video of uh, Joe Biden or a counterfeit version of Joe Biden. Even when this version answers your questions with good, truthy answers. But I do think, actually, we are in a time and in an issue and a subject that we are in need of philosophers. And so here's a very special one, Dan Dennett. Can we turn the house lights up? This, this isn't theater for me. I'm a professor. This is, this is a lecture. I want to see your faces. Please, can we turn the house lights up? Let's see if this works. A very old-fashioned PowerPoint. Okay, let's get going. Uh, this is going to be completely different from everything you've just had today. I, I'm feeling sort of weird with my, my uh, clunky little PowerPoints here. But the reason they are clunky is that I have a message that I really want you to pay attention to. And so I'm both going to say it, and you're going to be able to see the words at the same time. You won't be distracted by any pictures. <laughs> Except for one. And how many of you, can we turn the house lights up further? I still have a hard time seeing a lot of people. That's it? OK. Well, uh, yes, you are. Thank you very much for coming. And thanks to everybody at Dent and the wonderful staff, all the help you've given me and all the wonderful talks that I've heard. It's been a real treat, and I, I'm so grateful to you all. Uh, how many of you have read Borges' story, The Library of Babel? How many of you have not? Oh, too many. All right, I'm going to have to spend a little bit of time on this. So this is a wonderful story. You should read it. But it's about a library that has all the possible books in it up to 500 pages long. Each book is 500 pages, 2,000 characters per page. That gives you 100 to the millionth power different volumes. One of them has simply a capital letter A at the beginning. That's it. One of them has the text of Moby Dick followed by uh, the lyrics of the song you just heard. Uh, uh, Moby Dick exists there, and so do its lookalikes. There are over 100 million variants on Moby Dick that have just a single character, a single typo difference. So there's a whole galaxy of Moby Dicks, but it's vanishingly small in the whole set. Uh, uh, 100 to the millionth power is a finite number. We need a name for it. So my word for it is vast which stands for very much more than astronomical. <laughs> I mean, the number of electrons in the universe doesn't come close to the number of books in the Library of Babel. Vanishing is its reciprocal. It's like infinitesimal. The Library of Babel is an infinite, and these small amounts aren't infinitesimal, but they are vanishing. And I want to give you an idea just I really want to drive home how big this space is. So, there's the Library of Babel. A vast but vanishing subset of those are composed of English words. A vast but vanishing subset of those are grammatical. Most of them are just word salad. English words, but not grammatical. A vast but vanishing subset of those Makes sense. Among the ones that don't are what would get, you would get if you went to the library, took out a thousand books, simply copied a sentence at random out of each book, one after the other. A vast but vanishing subset of those 
are about somebody named John. <laughs> a vast, remember, vast but vanishing subset of those are about the death of JFK. A vast but vanishing subset of those are true. <laughs> and finally, a vast but vanishing set of the true books about the assassination of JFK are composed entirely of limericks. <laughs> there are more books in the Library of Babel that fit in that last category than there are in all the libraries in the world. So it's a big space. And until now, the only way that anything of any interest got in there, most of it's just complete chaos, is because people like us wrote books and poems and treatises and articles and so forth. That's the world's literature and the world's Reddit and the world's tweets and all the rest of that. The Moby Dick Galaxy, oh, I'm going to skip over this. It's just, you need, a, you need uh, all the books beginning with Aardvark's Love Mozart are on the R shelf on the first corridor on the first floor in the library. You can't, you can't put those books in a three-dimensional space. It's just too many of them. We need a multi-dimensional, million-dimensional space to store all those books uh, accurately. Among the books, are, never mind, I miss it. You get the idea. <laughs> Thousands of books that recount the dream you're going to have tomorrow. Followed, of course, by Moby Dick. <laughs> okay. So the branches in this, the branches that actually exist that are worth reading, or that you might think were worth reading, are all related. They're descendants of other branches. You can't have Shakespeare without Shakespeare's contemporaries and earlier authors and Plato and Aristotle and all the rest. In this million-dimensional space, all the readable texts are descendants of other texts. Composed, authored, copied by human language users until now. Now we have just invented a new machine which makes attention-grabbing, fascinating, interesting volumes in the Library of Babel. Those are la large language models. This is an entirely new thing that has never existed before in the history of language on this planet. LLMs can produce texts that are descendants of the existing lineages. They're not made by the same methods. We need to be informed about which kind of text generator we are using. And that's where the problem lies. Not because people are always better. Sometimes GPS, chat GPT can write a better answer than you can. Not because only conscious, sentient beings can mean anything. That's a complete red herring. LLMs can't, they're not conscious, they're not sentient. They, they can't even really, in some important sense, mean anything. And yet they can generate texts that seem to mean things. We must avoid anthroponormativity. I made that word up. It means... <laughs> It's like heteronormativity. It means don't think that just because it's something made by anthropos that it's better than something made by an LLM. We can't trust that. We just want to know they're different, and we want to be able to tell which is which. LLMs aren't people. They are counterfeit people, or they are the makers of counterfeit people. And I'm going to say a bit more about counterfeiting a little later on. Well, right now, I guess. <laughs> counterfeit people are more like novelists, historical novelists and historians, because they're not interested in truth, they're interested in truthiness. 
The historical novelists can say whatever they like, but they want it to seem to be a story about 18th century Vienna, let's say. So a lot of it really rings true. It wouldn't be a good historical novel, but they don't give a damn about whether it's actually the truth about anything. And that same thing is true about LLMs so far. They have no commitments to honesty or to shame. As Bertrand Russell once said, their creative process has all the advantages of theft over honest toil. These are counterfeit speech acts made by counterfeit people. The main difference is that real people have skin in the game. They can feel shame, they can feel anxious, they can feel mortal, they can feel threatened, they can feel like they really want to be respected by other human beings. They want to be taken seriously, not LLNs. Now, I'm now going to trot out, and this is why I'm using these funky, I'm, this is my simple argument, and it is simple, but you have to pay attention. So this is a philosopher talking, this is my lecture, here's my simple argument, a bunch of steps. Follow along, and I hope there'll be time at the end you can challenge, let me tell you, my message today is scary as the devil. I would love to be talked out of it. I would love for somebody to refute me, because then I could go back to doing things that are a lot more fun, <laughs> quite frankly. But I feel I have, to, I have to raise consciousness about these issues. Okay, first step. Any software, such as LLMs, but also every other software, can be replicated with ultra high free, uh, fidelity, right? Everybody knows that. Two, if there are also mutations, either intentional or inadvertent or accidental, then evolution by natural selection will occur. If you have high fidelity replication and mutation, then some mutations are going to be better at replicating than others, and that's what fitness is. The mutations that are fitter, better at getting themselves replicated, will increase in frequency in the population. Okay? They will not be alive, or conscious, or sentient. Forget about these wrinkles. A lot of my fellow philosophers write books and articles about these all the time, and these are just dangerous distractions. They're red herrings. Forget about it. It's an interesting theoretical question, but it's not important because the danger I'm talking about is with us today. It was with us yesterday, and I want to make sure we don't waste our time on fussy philosophical questions. They will be like viruses. In fact, they are a kind of virus. Extremely good at manipulating their hosts to reproduce them. As you know, viruses travel light. They don't have their own copy machinery. Viruses copy by commandeering the, com the copying machinery of others, other cells. They worm their way into a cell and they use, they use the copy machinery inside the cell. Memes do the same thing. They worm themselves into us, we're the copy machines, and we reproduce them, and we make more and more copies. Right now, the replication of LLMs is more or less under control, but not completely. Now, Darwin taught us the key to domestication is control of reproduction. That was his definition of domestication. Notice we have species that are not domesticated, but they are synanthropic. Synanthropic. They thrive with people. Bed bugs, house mice, rats, pigeons, barn swallows. They're synanthropic. Nobody owns them. Nobody, they're not domesticated 
but they thrive in our company. So what I'm now talking about are synanthropic, non-domesticated memes, things that can be copied and reproduced. Mutations that escape human control will be feral. We heard the word feral before today, feral, feral camels. They will be relatively impervious to human efforts to extinguish them. So we should expect a population explosion of dangerous, manipulative, attention-grabbing memes, mind viruses, to engulf us. I'm saying that's what we can expect right now. It's beginning to happen right now. This will endanger human trust, which is a very important feature of civilization. Your friend calls you. You want to, it's your friend's voice, it sounds like your friend, you're having a conversation with your friend. You're not going to be able to know whether that's your friend or a counterfeit version of your friend. You aren't going to know whether this is a real video of uh, Joe Biden or a counterfeit version of Joe Biden. Even when this version answers your questions with good, truthy answers. Civilization is more fragile than people realize. Now, this is my self-advertisement. The intentional stance is my, one of my proudest contributions to thinking about minds. And it's simply the tactic of treating complicated things we want to understand as if they were agents with agendas, beliefs and desires. And the intentional stance is innate in us. We grow up wanting to adopt the intentional stance to anything complicated that we see around us, anything that puzzles us. Or is, we say, who's there? What kind of an agent is doing this? Who, who are you? What do you believe? What do you want? Because maybe it wants me. It's a very good adaptation that we have. So is your dog. Your dog, if the snow falls off the roof in a thaw and it lands with a thud outside the window, your dog jumps up and says, Rawr. but then the dog relaxes after a while. But it's thinking, who's there? Who's there? Who's there? We do it all the time. But we go on thinking about it, and that's how religions got invented. But that's another story. The point is that we cannot resist adopting the intentional stance when we are faced with apparently sensible language. We're just, it's just, it's a new environment and we're not equipped by evolution to deal with it. Evolution by natural selection has not prepared us with adaptations to survive in the digital worlds we are now creating digital worlds that we are no longer entirely in control of. Nobody is. Nobody is. Those who do not abandon the internet entirely, which is one option, will be moving through minefields of attention gathering, attention attracting, clickbait devices, and only some of them are going to have been designed by clickbait designers that are human beings. They're going to be a, there's going to be an arms race of clickbait designers that evolve to hold your attention, to capture your attention, to close down your degrees of freedom and get you to think about one thing only, which is replicate this. Replicate this. So they will need protection. Just the way our ancestors needed protection when they ventured into hostile environments, in polar regions, underwater, in the air, and so forth. We need new technology to protect us in this new digital world that we're spending more and more of our time in. Those who abandon the internet will be left unable to learn what is happening in the world, including any safety measures we came up with. They're going to be benighted. 
So unless we take very strong steps immediately, immediately, to protect and spread these new viruses, we will be soon entering a dark age. Darker than the dark ages that you learned about in medieval history. It may be too late to stop this from happening. But if we mobilize the most capable creators of immunizing systems and other safeguards, we may be able to control the situation roughly the way we can now overcome pandemics like COVID. Not entirely. COVID is coming back this fall. And we're going to have, this is going to be an arms race, and we're going to have to be ready to fight it with all our might if we're going to protect ourselves from those dark ages. Anybody scared yet? I hope so. I mean this with complete and deadly seriousness. It's time to get working on all this. Now, thanks for your attention, but I put this in here. I didn't know how much time it was going to take me, so I've got several thanks for your attention slides coming along. Now I'm going to go on. I've got a few more minutes, so I'm going to go on. <laughs> so thanks for even more attention. <laughs> so I'm going to give you, some of you may be thinking, I don't know about this. Uh, about the evolution of software. Uh, LLMs such as GPT-3 and GPT-4 are huge software systems. They're not going to be copied. They are huge, huge, huge software systems, and nobody's going to be able to afford the disk space, you know, the cloud storage to copy them in large numbers. They're, they're not what are, those are, are going to be uh, uh, the generators of diversity in the evolution. They're going to be the, the, the makers of candidates, the mutation makers uh, that uh, keep providing new populations to be selected from. Uh, OK? Um, it's their products that are going to be replicated. And mainly because their products are going to be chosen by us. Not for good reasons, but just because it's caught our attention and manipulated us, and so we're going to copy them. Remember, these are going to be feral. These are not going to be domesticated. Some of them we may choose for very good reasons. Hey, this is a really great thing I've just found. But in general, we can't count on that. Uh, some of you may have thought, well, look, mutations are actually going to be rare in software because mutations, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms are single nucleotides. These are mutations, spot mutations. They're like typos. Typos in computer land, in digital world, really not much of a problem. We have all sorts of safeguards uh, uh, in, in software development, which largely screen out the typos. And we have things like parity check bits that screen out the inadvertent errors that creep in from noise and so forth. Amazingly high fidelity. So we don't have to worry about SNPs. What we have to worry about is not typos, but Thinkos. Thinkos are higher level mistakes. They're not typing errors. They're thinking errors. And if you don't think software designers make thinking errors, ask yourself, how many times have you waited for Word or Excel or some other program to, to serve you up a new version, an improved version? Years after software has been released to the public, they're still finding thinkos that need repair. It's almost impossible to write pristine, thinko-free software, and that's going to be as true of LLMs as anything else. It's the programming errors, the human thinkos, that will be the main source of mutations, but not just human thinkos. 
because now people are working on getting GPTS or, or, or GPT-4, for instance, to make it's, to write its own software. And it can make Thinkos, too. So we have to worry about all the mutations that arise from these. Uh, all right, I already said that. A few anecdotes just to clue you in. How much time do I have? Oh, I've got lots of time. <laughs> There's a book that you might want to read by Scott Shapiro called Fancy Bear Goes Fishing. It's a brand new book. He is a combination philosopher, law professor, and hacker. Rare combo. And this is a book about cyber warfare and its dangers and hacking. It's very well written and it's full of inside information. It's brand new and I highly recommend it. And one of the things that starts off the book is Robert Morris's infamous uh, uh, mole uh, from way back in the, uh, what year was it, 1988, which s ground a lot of computers around the world uh, to a halt uh, because he hadn't, he made a thinko that, that meant that it shut down most of the computers that it, that it came in contact with. Back in about 91 or so, I was here in Santa Fe at the Santa Fe Institute at one of the first artificial life workshops. And one of the people there was Tom Ray, whom some of you may know of. He wrote the program Tierra, which was a program which evolved. That's why he was at the artificial life meet. It evolved and it gobbled up space on your, on your hard disk on your, in your core, in your core memory. And Tom gave a wonderful talk about Tierra and how it was, how it evolved and how it mutated. And then he talked briefly about how he was going to put it on the internet. And we all said, no, no, Tom, believe your own hype. You don't want to release this on the internet. And he didn't. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> or a lot of this might have happened a lot earlier. I don't know. It may have been like Three Mile Island or Chernobyl. It might have warned us all of the dangers a long time ago. It might have been a good thing after all. We, it's hard to tell. And another one is a, about the red team at OpenAI. This was an article that appeared in The Atlantic just a, f just a few weeks ago. Um, uh, in July, does Sam Altman know what he's creating? And you read that article in The Atlantic and you will read a chilling story about how their red team, which is designed to try to protect, you know, they, before they let it out of the house, they have a, a hot team of their best engineers sort of try to goad it into toxic behavior. They're testing to see if it's toxic and it ran away from them. Uh, I won't give you the details, I'll just tell you, that's a scary story. What can be done? I'm going to now uh, sit a little bit. Uh, counterfeit money has been correctly seen to be a very specific offense against society ever since money was invented. In fact, originally when money was invented, the penalty for counterfeiting money was typically capital punishment. It's been viewed as a very serious crime against civilization, against society, against the nation, against the king, but against the economy, it's bad. Counterfeit money is bad, but with technology, we how many of you look closely at every $20 bill you ever get in change? You don't bother. Why? Because you trust the protective technology that makes it really pretty hard to counterfeit money successfully. And because if you get caught making counterfeit money, you go to prison. And it's just not worth it for most people. 
I just heard, read the other day, there's counterfeit $100 bills. Nobody's bothering doing counterfeit 20s anymore. That's inflation for you. But there are counterfeit hundreds uh, floating around. So you might want to look at your $100 bills a bit now. But uh, in Europe, they're way ahead of us. And they created um, uh, uh, the Euroion constellation, which is a watermark system which goes on most of the world's currency, which unlike ours, tends to be multicolored. And here's a lovely fact. If you don't, you probably, some of you already know this. Every color copy maker in the world puts in software in their color copier which will shut their copiers down if they see a Urion constellation on something you put in there. You cannot readily counter, you cannot readily make color copies of currency thanks to the software that's embedded in copy machines. Well, can't we take a hint from that and do something like that? Can't we create watermark systems? And first of all, make sure that every manufacturer of cell phones, laptops, tablets, computers in the world puts the software in it, the latest version of the software in it, which will detect the watermarks that we will cajole OpenAI and Google and Microsoft and the rest of the makers of LLMs that will flag anything with uh, uh, fake, fake, counterfeit, don't believe it, or don't believe that it's, you're talking to a person, don't believe that this is, this is for real. Now, uh, according, uh, to Eric Horvitz, who's the chief scientist at Microsoft, they're, they're making real progress on this. He says they don't have a perfect system yet, but that's the mainly the system they have now is for deep fake videos. Deep fake um, GPT-3 or chat GPT uh, conversations is another matter, and, and that's not yet as far as I know, well under him, but there are lots of people working on it. But my, my claim is we need 10 times or 100 times more really technical wizards working on protecting ourselves from the infections that are going to happen with counterfeit people in the near future. By the way, I looked this up yesterday. A LinkedIn article tells you how to bypass the Orion constellation, but it warns of its illegality. Yeah. Uh, thank you for passing on the information, LinkedIn. This is, this is why it may be too late. This is why it may be too late. Okay. An arms race, but one that can probably lead to a truce. I am hoping that we can get our hands on this enough so that at least we can hold our own for a while, so that people can go on getting into their internet worlds, where we spend so much of our time, and trusting the people they're talking to and interacting with because it's like a $20 bill today. You, you don't have to worry that much. We, we, we've, we've got a handle on this situation. You may once in a while get fooled, and it's an arms race. We've got to keep our vigilance up all the time. But we may be able, it's, it's like vaccination, folks. If all, okay, I've already said this. Google and YouTube have just announced that all political ads must have a prominent warning on them if they use AI. A small step, but a worthy one. Let's make sure it's the first of many big steps that follow suit in this. 
Some of you may have watched the congressional hearing of a few weeks ago. This is a, the reason these PowerPoints are so clunky is that I, I've been working on this sort of night and day for the last month. And uh, at the con congressional hearing, a number of the Congress people, I think you may have heard this, marveled. They said this is the first time industry has ever come to us begging for regulation. Well, we know why they're begging for regulation. They're scared stiff, one, of being sued in cases that would make the Dominion settlement in the Fox News case look like chump change. These are deep pockets. They've got liability insurance, and there could be a lot of real danger uh, to them, to their pocketbooks. They're billionaires. Let's make them worry about their pocketbooks. But another thing, of course, is that they want to capture regulation, which is a, a standard problem. So we're going to have to keep Congress's feet to the fire. Um, there are a number of congressmen, a number of senators, and their staffs that are now looking at this. We're trying to keep them informed, but it's sometimes a losing battle. Uh, uh, a few of my colleagues working on this had a special session a few weeks ago to prep one of us, not me, to talk to some representatives, some aides of a very well-known senator, I won't say who, and they were clueless. We, had, we, had, we have to educate them, and we have to educate them fast. Maybe this is a time for strict liability laws. If you invent a counterfeiting machine such as GPT-4, you could be held strictly liable for any damage that results. It's time to get working on all this. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>